My topic today uh, is searching for principles of freedom of expression is really part one and it concerns the Holmes and Brandeis era uh, during and immediately after World War I. Uh, we tend to think of our constitutional rights as coming like gifts from Olympian gods, uh, the gods being the founding fathers, Jefferson, Hamilton, Madison. It isn't so, at least not with regard to freedom of expression. Uh, Hamilton in the Federalist Papers asked a rhetorical question which indicated something of a lack of confidence that a principle of a Bill of Rights would work. What signifies a declaration that liberty of the press shall be inviolably preserved? What is liberty of the press? Who can give it any definition that would not leave utmost latitude for evasion? Well, Hamilton's answer was, we shouldn't have a Bill of Rights. And it took uh, the states, uh, a Madison flip-flop, and a number of other events to change that answer. But the truth is, we don't get a legal answer to the question until the 20th century. And my task is to try to give you a three-part summary of how that answer came into existence as a matter of law. The history of the First Amendment doctrine really begins in World War I. Uh, it was a time of hysteria. Not only a time of war, but a time of anti-German prejudice. Uh, the famous historians, Henry Steele Comager and Samuel Eliot Morrison, in their classic text used in colleges throughout the latter half of the 20th century, said it was an era in which the government indulged in greater excesses than any previous time. And the reason for that is that there wasn't much restraint provided by law. There are a few principles to keep in mind. One, freedom of speech to the extent that it existed was a matter of state law and state politics. Two, if you looked to federal cases, you'd find about all it meant was, all freedom of speech meant was no prior restraint, no censorship. You didn't have to submit your publication to a censor before you could actually publish. That had been a process abolished in England back in 1725. So almost literally there had been no legal progress on this subject between 1725 and arguably 1925. Finally, the doctrines said you were responsible for sedition. You were responsible if you committed acts, that is words, of subversive advocacy. And there were a lot of people who went to jail during this period. There was something called the Espionage Act of 1917 and the Sedition Act of 1918, which did essentially the same thing as the Sedition Act back in 1798. It said, if you criticized the government and caused them to be unpopular, you could go to jail. Now, I just want to pause for a moment and let you consider all the people in America today who would go to jail if they made the president unpopular. And the latest is Daryl Gates. Um, it's, it's not a principle you can live with and still have a principle of freedom of speech. But to give you an example of how extreme the application was, there were 1,500 prosecutions in the World War I era under these statutes, and some of them created some unusual situations. The first is a case that has a title that I love to tell to my students. It is, and I'm not kidding about this, this is not satire, The United States versus The Spirit of 76. The Spirit of 76 was a movie produced in Hollywood. It was a silent movie, and it was about the American Revolution the spirit of 76. And federal prosecutors seized the film and destroyed it because it would make people anti-British. Well, we're in the middle of World War I. Britain was our ally, so this publication, the film, had a bad tendency to undermine patriotic war spirit, and therefore it violated free speech. The uh, producer was sentenced to 10 years in prison, 
and served three for daring to make a movie about the American Revolution. And the other cases are not without their own versions of color and surprise. A Vermont minister prepared and distributed a pamphlet. I know by, I don't know by what technology, but I assume it's some early version of a mimeograph machine. And it said, surely, if Christians are forbidden to preserve the person of their Lord and Master, they may not fight to preserve themselves or any city where they would happen to dwell. Well, this controversial sentiment was given to one woman, two men above military age, another clergyman, and one young man of military age. And because it was given to that one young man, it had a bad tendency to persuade him not to report for military service. And under the espionage of 1917, the minister was served, uh, sentenced to serve 15 years in jail. He served one. Now the doctrine at the time said this is okay. If you said something that had a bad tendency to undermine the interests of the government, you were not protected by the free speech principle at this time. Not until the Supreme Court got to work, uh, and that really begins in 1919. In 1919, there are a flurry of decisions. You may not know it, but you in fact know them well, because I assure you, every one of you have been in a discussion about free speech, and I think you probably all have quoted these decisions, even though you probably don't remember the name of the decision you are quoting. The key case is Schenck versus the United States, 1919. It's an opinion by Oliver Wendell Holmes about a man who produced a pamphlet which said, don't serve, assert your rights. The draft is a violation of the 13th Amendment. And for these radical, subversive, dangerous sentiments, he was convicted under federal law. Now the case goes before the court and Oliver Wendell Holmes begins his long and storied career as a uh, exponent and judge of free speech principles. And his most famous phrases are in this opinion, though I think you'll probably agree with me, it's not his best. The first is, you can't shout fire falsely in a crowded theater. You've all heard it. Um, you've also probably heard the phrase, clear and present danger. Well, that phrase comes from this case. The federal government may prosecute somebody if their words create a clear and present danger of substantive evil Congress has a right to prevent. Now, this is a tougher standard than the older bad tendency test. Holmes is trying to create more protection for free speech, but ultimately he says it's a matter of proximity and degree, and he holds that the man's conviction is upheld. And it's upheld on the principle that free speech is different in times of war than in times of peace. Now, Oliver Wendell Holmes' biography is intruding here. You need to remember that he was a Union veteran of the Civil War. He was three times wounded. He was quite proud of his service. And he was still deeply affected by the fact that almost all of his friends in the units in which he served had been killed or maimed. And he was bitterly resentful of the Copperhead Democrats who had undermined President Lincoln's efforts. He believed that that exercise of free speech undermined the Union. And so his first draft in the Schenck case, the Frohert case, and the Debs case, though it contained the words clear and present danger, actually deferred quite dramatically to the judgments of prosecutors and upheld convictions. And his first work didn't receive a whole lot of applause in the place that he knew and cherished best. Harvard criticized him. And so did a judge by the name of Learned Hand. Learned Hand goes down in history as the best English-speaking judge never to serve on the United States Supreme Court. Uh, he served on the very prestigious Second Circuit, 
but he never had the time and opportunity of a uh, presidential nomination to be on the Supreme Court. Hand admitted he wasn't much in love with Holmesy's test, that was his words, and he thought the clear and present danger test was a mistake. It made it a question of fact and proximity and chiten uh, tightening the chain of causation. He didn't think that would work. In his words, once you admit that the matter is one of degree, you give to every Tom, Dick, and Harry, comma, DJ, district judge, so much latitude that the jig is up. And the evidence was in the Schenck, Frowerk, and Debs cases. The Debs case is the famous case involving Eugene Debs, the legendary socialist candidate for president, who managed to say in public, I abhor war, I hate war, and for that he went to jail, partly because he was a man of influence and prestige. Hand wanted a qualitative formula, hard, conventional, and difficult to evade. And think of that phrase, difficult to evade. That's Learned Hand's answer to Alexander Hamilton. We need principles that do not leave utmost latitude for evasion, and that requires a qualitative doctrinal formula. Truth is, in 1919, we just didn't have that. Well, Learned Hand's criticism and the criticism of Mr. Holmes' friends at Harvard had an effect on him. And within the same year, 1919, Oliver Wendell Holmes is writing a dissenting opinion in the case of Abrams versus the United States. And it's here that Holmes begins his legendary career as a defender of free speech. It is in the Abrams case that he first talks of the fact that freedom of speech means there must be a marketplace of ideas. And in this marketplace of ideas, all ideas must be available to the public to pick and choose so that the strongest ideas survive. Holmes was a social Darwinist, though he criticized it as constitutional doctrine in many cases. And he was in particular an academic intellectual Darwinist, believing that the free trade of ideas would result in the finest thinking and more wisdom. His words, Persecution for expression of opinion seems to me perfectly logical. If you have no doubt of your premises or your power and want a certain result with all your heart, you naturally express your wishes in law and sweep away all opposition. But when men have realized that time has upset many fighting faiths, they may come to believe even more than they believe the very foundations of their own conduct. The ultimate good desired is better reached by a free trade in ideas. At the best test of truth is the power of the thought to get itself accepted in the competition of the market, and that truth is the only ground upon which their wishes can be carried out. That, at any rate, is the theory of our Constitution. Now, these words have caused many hearts, including my own, to beat rapturously as we hear every phrase. But the truth is, it wasn't the theory of our Constitution until Holmes said it. And he said it in the dissenting opinion, and it doesn't become the law for another 50 years. This has to be a slow process. The next case we should mention is Gitlow versus New York. Now, this is a case which said it's unlawful to advocate the overthrow of the government by violent means. There are many such cases recurring through American history. And I'll discuss another one in the third talk I give this morning. The Supreme Court upholds the case, and it upholds the case based upon this deferential bad tendency idea. Even a few incendiary remarks may cause a conflagration. Reasonable people can believe this, and reasonable people can. We'll have an example of it within a decade in Germany where a few incendiary remarks are going to cause eventually the Third Reich. It's not a possibility that we should put out of our head. But Holmes dissents again. 
And again, he says, the issue is freedom of speech. Eloquence may set fire to reason, he writes, but whatever may be thought of the redundant discourse before us, it had no chance of starting a present conflagration. If in the long run the beliefs expressed in the proletarian dictatorship are destined to be accepted by the dominant forces of the community, the only meaning of free speech is that they should be given their chance and have their way. Now this is a remarkable concept for a Union veteran, a son of Harvard, a member of the privileged class, but it is pressing the theory of our country to its logical point. You must give the people access to all ideas so that they can make the public policy choices associated with democracy. Louis Brandeis was Oliver Wendell Holmes' partner on the court, and he made his contribution in the Whitney versus California case, 1927. Here's another case in which a state, this one California, said it was unlawful to advocate overthrow of the government, and it was unlawful to join an organization which advocated the overthrow of the government, and Ms. Whitney had done both, even though she had tried to stop that policy while being a member of the organization. The fact she was a member, and the fact that the organization did advocate it, was enough to cause her conviction, even despite her own personal opposition to some of the resolutions in the internal proceedings of the organization. In a concurring opinion, Brandeis agrees she must be convicted. He writes his own theory of freedom of expression, which builds on Holmes. And it's the Holmes-Brandeis tradition that represents the foundation of free speech doctrine today. Brandeis says advocacy is not enough. Advocacy that falls short of incitement must be tolerated. His words, the wide difference between advocacy and incitement, between preparation and attempt, between assembling and conspiracy must be borne in mind. In order to support a finding of clear and present danger, it must be shown either that immediate serious violence was to be expected or advocated, or that past conduct furnished reason to believe such an advocacy was then contemplated. Only an emergency can justify repression. And there you have it. That's the ideal that Holmes and Brandeis are fighting for. And again, we're not going to see it in law until the late 1960s. The Holmes-Brandeis tradition yields a number of important principles. One, the marketplace of ideas concept. Two, the idea that only emergency, genuine emergency, can justify political repression. Three, there must be an effort to try to fix the line between protected and unprotected conduct close to where the conduct is really an attempt to commit a crime, where it's not just speech, but it is a kind of criminal conduct. And most important, picking and choosing among the ideas that may be presented to the people and forbidding some of those ideas to be expressed is the cardinal sin of the First Amendment. That's viewpoint discrimination. And that's the moment when the Supreme Court and the federal courts must pay, must pay careful attention to the issues of the case and be very demanding, very strict, and very searching to make sure that whatever the government is doing is absolutely necessary. The next talk will discuss how these principles play out during the McCarthy era. Freedom 101 is made possible by generous support from the University of Oklahoma Alumni Association. Freedom 101 is a program of the Institute for the American Constitutional Heritage at the University of Oklahoma. For more videos and podcasts, visit freedom.ou.edu.